our second debate we're going to be having is asking the question, uh, is the lack of openness in much of our community harming our mental health, happiness, and professional progression? And to have this debate with me, can I call to the stage, please, sports and media consultant Michelle Moore. <laughs> Founder of Dope Black Dads, Mr. Marvin Harrison. <laughs> Businesswoman and director of Influential Insights, Aziza Francis. and the CEO of Mind in the Bar of Haringey, Lynette Charles. Hi guys. Hello. You all good? Thank you very much for, for joining me this evening. Okay, so let's get into it. This is quite a heavy one. Um, and I've kind of got a heavyweight panel here to try and answer a lot of the questions and hopefully we can progress this and move it forward. Um, let me start with you, Lynette. Um, do you, still, do you feel that as, as black people, we still have problems in discussing and being very open about our mental health and our general happiness? Uh, yeah, great. No pressure. There. No, it's great. It's great. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I work in mental health every day. And what I see is when people experience mental health problems, often it's their own family and their community that reject them. So there's definitely something about a fear, a fear that if you know somebody with mental health, somehow you're gonna get that mental health problem or you're gonna be affected by the fact they're affected. So absolutely, we need to talk more about mental health, generally, and be more open about how we get through things because actually mental health is us, it's our experiences, discrimination being one of them. You know, just going back to the conversation we had before when we're put in situations where we've always got to make other people feel okay about the problems that we've had in this country. So absolutely, we need to all be more open and we all know something about mental health. Marvin, let me come to you next, sir. Um, before I ask my question, can you just briefly explain what your platform is, Dope Black Dads, because it'll be, it'll be uh, not known by many people in the room, because a lot of people... Thanks, we've been working hard. Only because, only because I know a lot of people aren't on social media, aren't online, um, and I want them to know about the work that you do. Tell us a little bit about Dope Black Dads and why you started it. So, uh, Father's Day last year, I, I set up Dope Black Dads. It basically was a group of 23 fathers in my phone, which was to indicate um, uh, uh, me saying thank you for being a bit of a North Star in terms of parenting. So my father wasn't around in my life and so my son was probably two at the time um, and I was very, very consciously parenting uh, and co-parenting with my wife. And um, as anybody knows, it's very difficult um, and it's a very challenging experience, especially for fathers. Um, and so I set it up uh, with 23 people and then nobody left after Father's Day, which is a good sign for a group because people always leave. Um, and then um, shortly afterwards, we just started talking more and we found ourselves talking about a range of subjects, how we raise our, our children, what the principles are, how do we adapt to um, religion. And we started to think, actually, this is quite rich information. It doesn't live anywhere. Um, and then when I started asking people about the other groups they have, they were like, yeah, we talk about football, we talk about girls, we talk about, you know, like where the banter's happening. But we weren't talking about real issues that were affecting us as individuals, not even community-wide, just us as people. Um, and so we started a podcast in, in October, and we started to build a narrative, and then we got probably to like 75 members, and then The Guardian got in touch and said, we love your podcast, we'd love to talk about it. And basically from there in January, it's kind of exploded into, um, uh, for, in our context exploded, because I think for us, it was just a very pure idea. It wasn't built to be anything more than, we're 23 people, thank you. Then it was actually, this is a, a safe space. You can say whatever you want about your ideas around women, religion, sexuality, and we can hone an understanding collectively. We're not gonna label you at the, at the end of it. And I think that people found that quite helpful in this very sensitive time. And then afterwards, so I'm, I'm filibustering your, your panel, sorry. Um, and so then afterwards, shortly afterwards, we, we, we built the podcast out. We had our BBC run um, for our podcast. We, we've been talking on uh, many issues. So actually the last panel is really interesting because for me, speaking on all of these platforms, um, 
I don't want to go too long, but very, very quickly, when I did the LBC panel with Nick Ferrari, uh, uh, interview with Nick Ferrari, uh, I'd done a Channel 5 interview with this guy called Tony Sewell, um, and we basically disagreed politely about our views in terms of single mothers and the roles of fathers. And then they called me back on LBC to redo the debate, but they tried to basically present him as the correct answer. They didn't tell me he was on. And I asked, and they said, no, we just want to have a chat with you. Then they put him on, and they put him on first, and then left me there to answer his rebuttal, which I thought was a tactic. And so, and then also Nick Ferrari is, as you all know, isn't particularly kind and loving of our community. And so being in that environment, I actually suffered a panic attack um, like a week after, like a mild one. And it just came because my consciousness was telling me that this, this conversation isn't for public discourse. Mm. It's not a healthy conversation for us to be having and affronting. I think what's more important is that we, I'm filibustering your panel, I'm very sorry. What's more, what's more important is, <laughs> this wasn't the plan. Well, what's more important is, is that we come to a consensus about what our lived experience is, and we don't then need to sit there and debate it with anybody. And I want to take complete, thank you. I, I, I really want to take complete ownership of our own experience as a community, and we will communicate on our own platforms, um, unfiltered, and people can choose to accept it or not. What people don't understand is that this is the first mass middle-class generation that we've ever had within a black community. And there's a lot of us operating without the guidance or knowledge. I can't go to my mum and say, please explain to me what happens when you get to this place. Unfortunately, I've been able to surpass her at a very early age. And so I'm operating off of networks very similar to my WhatsApp groups. Like, how do we do this? How are we figuring this out? There is a large tax on this generation of, of, of black people that has been unprecedented. And I think there's been fantastic work that's happened before, but we're in a new space now. And so for me, when I ask that question, it's a very, very big question. I'm very big on mental well-being. I, I'm, I think we all suffer from mental illness on some level. I think we ultimately are suffering from PTSD at the very least, if not more. I think the clinical side of it, I try to stay away from because I never want to label somebody with that without professional help. But I think we all need to do that work internally, which is a phrase that we use to start exploring yourself and I can see my bro, bro, your attire made me extremely happy, bro. That's really, but yeah, so I, I, that very quickly, I, I think it's very important that we start to explore ourselves, to understand ourselves in this country, and whether we are here to stay to be British, or are we removing ourselves and going back to somewhere else, which could also have problems. And I think when you understand the difference between the two things, you behave differently, because you now have a goal, rather than being here hoping that this wonderful Conservative Party, which are currently navigating us, are going to come up with a policy that improves your experience. They have never, ever done that. We're going to get there. You've used up your whole time, by the way, on the, on the panel. Here, right? <laughs> no, but facts, facts. Um, Aziza, do you ever remember a time when you were younger and you were at the family table or just at home where discussions around how people were, were feeling, was ever had. Do you remember a time when any of your friends that were black ever told you about being around the table and saying, you know what, I'm struggling right now, or I feel a bit crap right now, and it being received in a, in a positive way? I don't think my experiences speak for my community because my experiences are extremely unique. My mother is a psychotherapist. Mm, no, so that's the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in therapy. Um, but what I will say is, um, following from what you were saying and some of the conversation I heard earlier about just debate and our role as black people in debate and us talking here now about mental health, I think there's always a, a rush to find that black person to speak and we're not training, we're having conversations, we're meeting up, we're having groups, but we're not training to be able to hold the space and debate. So when you say should we be in the space for conversation? We need to be ready for the conversation. We need to get trained for the conversation. Our greatest leaders trained before they stood up and spoke on our behalf. They educated themselves before they stood up and spoke on our behalf. And that's not what we're doing. We're having personal experiences, personal opinions, getting very passionate, getting very heated, jumping on platforms and speaking for a whole community. I am not a representation for the black woman. I am a representation of Aziza Francis. Yes, I'm a black woman. Yes, I'm a part of the black community. But how many black women grew up with a mum in the 90s that was a psychotherapist? Yes. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, 
you know, mental health. I grew up on a council estate. I grew up on Mitesville council estate, where there was killings, guns, shootings, influx of yardies and teenage pregnancy and all the horrific things that you could imagine happening in a low-income community. But when you live in a house with no television and a library and a piano and a psychotherapist for a mum, what's going on outside your front door, that's, play, that's the playground and this is your reality. That's how I was raised. I had two different voices. So when I would go outside, I could speak slang and when I stepped in my front door, my mother expected me to speak English. I was raised in the context of I am a queen. That's how my mum raised me. You're a princess now in the process of becoming a queen. My mum was radical. She made me wear African attire in the hood. <laughs> we stood out. <laughs> I'm not from Africa, I'm from the Caribbean. And my mum would make me wear a dashiki when it wasn't popping and black girl magic wasn't trending. And I had to walk for a council estate when everybody had Nike Air Jordans on in clogs and a dashiki and, and bantu knots. It weren't cute for me. <laughs> I'm not trying to say, Jordan. So my experience of my upbringing that was so colourful and so different is now trending. It's now cool. Everybody's into all of that now. That was my reality and it wasn't cool. It wasn't it, you know? Um, Michelle, you do a lot of work with, in particular, young girls and a lot of young, young black women. What are some of the, the difficulties and some of the things that you see in working with those young girls that prevents them from reaching their professional potential? I suppose when the work that I do in schools and at a grassroots level, using sport as a, as a vehicle to look at issues around identity and well-being and confidence, is, is, is a, a perfect vehicle to do that. And most of the issues are around identity and body image. And the, the pressure that they feel from social media to be validated by others, comparing themselves to those social media influencers who are unhealthy role models, to be perfectly frank. And then the pressure that they have just navigating the world as women, as young women and as women of colour. So that intersectional dimension is, is at play for them hugely. And for me, it's always really surprising that they just are in need of real, relatable role models. I, I've, you know, I've lived a life, I've had loads of different jobs, and one of my uh, jobs that I had was uh, an assistant head teacher many years ago now. And I would, uh, and I was very young to be an assistant head teacher, and I was the only woman of colour on, in the senior management team. And I would just have little brown skinned girls follow me around, and just all the brown and black kids hang out in my office for no other reason but the fact that I looked a bit like them, and they looked like me. So it was this whole thing of, you can't be it if you can't see it. So the power of the role model and that visibility piece is, is critical. And I was just recently hosting an event um, which was called It's Okay Not To Be Okay. Um, and it was for an organization called Goals for Girls. And one of my mentees is the CEO, Francesca Brown. And she runs this organization for young women to develop their self-esteem, to develop them as resilient human beings in the world and using this football program to deliver that and it's hugely successful but this event was so powerful because it had a, a panel of, of amazing women who had achieved great feats in their lives but they were talking really openly about their emotional vulnerabilities about they have to take a detox from social media they have to look at all of those self-care techniques for themselves to be themselves in the world and the girls really took to that, and they really kind of took a lot away from understanding who they are and the mental chatter that goes on in their brains isn't them, that they're not their thoughts. So there are huge amounts of pressures on young people today, and, and especially young women. And I also do a lot of work with professional women uh, in, the, in the kind of different professional settings that they find themselves in. And a lot of the issues are around how do they navigate the intersectional dimensions of discrimination? What is it they can do to show up and look after themselves at the same time and still forge ahead? Um, instead of just surviving the environment, how are they going to thrive in that environment? And often my advice is really very, is based on kind of experience and it's 
I'm not trained in any way other than having lived a life for 46 years and had enough discrimination to affect me, but understanding the function of discrimination and that it's a distraction. And that, as Toni Morrison tells us, that we should never actually argue with fools. And we've talked a lot about media. But one of the things that I, I get asked a lot is, what are the words? What words do we need? What's the techniques? And actually, a lot of this is about choosing your fights, choosing your battles, and then providing people with a script. And I do a lot of that, actually. Um, and I do a lot of cheerleading behind the background, and a lot of stuff around how can we open up our networks and do the sponsorship piece. Mentoring, for me, doesn't work unless you're prepared to help open doors as well for, for those in particular positions. I hear that. Um, Lynette, in a, in a bar like Haringey, where I'm assuming most, there's a high population of, of, of black people there. What work do organisations like mine do to reach out to those black people who are suffering with poor mental health to better their mental health? I suppose what we try and do is work with the community. Uh, obviously, I, I, I suppose lots of people in the audience have got opinions about MIND. Um, and MIND itself is an organisation that I hope as we go forward to the future will have more people like me running those organisations because traditionally it was a kind of white middle class organisation. I wouldn't say that lots of black people access their services. So what we do now at Mind in Harrogate is we actually go out into the community, share our skills and get the community to look after each other um, because there's lots that we can do. So we do everything from training to working alongside people to giving them our resources to helping them access funding for their group um, because it's a better way of reaching their community and breaking down that stigma um, and speaking to people in their own language. The other thing about Haringey, we've got something like 230 languages. I can assure you I only speak English. Um, so it's really about working with the community and trying to break that down and understanding why so many people in Haringey have mental health issues. Um, lots of deprivation, lots of seeing themselves left behind by a community um, that is prospering. Lots of people moving into Tottenham, can you imagine it? Um, because of the new stadium. Uh, so yeah, going out in the community and getting them to look after each other because that's, that's sustainable. Yeah, and they are actually experts. Yeah, with the right help and support, they are actually experts in their own mental health and their communities and what makes them resilient. I hear that. Aziza, talk to me about self-love and what that, what that means to you. Um, I think self-love is just about knowing who you are on a deeper spiritual level. I feel like in society today as black people, nobody speaks about um, our spirit. We're always talking about our physical and how we physically show up in the world and how we're physically attacked and how things affect us emotionally, but I feel like there's a spiritual side of us as a people collectively that's missing. And self-love for me is that opportunity to tap into who you are on a deeper level, a spiritual level that people can't touch, can't feel, that has nothing that anybody can look at, but is basically your soul. And just being intentional about how you show up. Um, I feel like we're constantly teaching young people how to show up and work but not teaching them how to show up in their truth. This is how you show up to survive today. This is not how you show up to learn today. So for my siblings who are younger than me, who, well, they're entrepreneurs now, my siblings don't even work, but um, when they were at work, I remember my sister getting a job at a company called um, Sophie Webster, and she's a graphics designer, extremely talented, and she said to me, a black man at her workplace spoke to her about her hair being an issue because it was natural. And how should she navigate that? She's not outspoken. She's very timid. She's an art, artist, 100% artsy-fartsy. And I said to her, get ready to leave. You're not there to grow. You're there to learn. You're there to learn how to become independent. So your job isn't navigating your way through the days there. Your job is to learn how to do the job better than everybody else in the room does it so you can do it one day for yourself. That, that's the only advice I have for you. Don't change your hairstyle, make it bigger, and learn. <laughs> um, so that's the basic thing that I've learned. Um, I, mean, I run workshops in London and in New York um, that focus solely on the spiritual side of self-love and not self-care. Because when people speak about self-love, 
often they're giving you a self-care package, which is then attached to brands that you can go out and buy to just make yourself feel better with a bit of incense and a bit of, forget the incense and all of that. <laughs> There's a lot more to be done than a bath bomb and some incense. So that's basically <laughs> what I do is create the space for that. And I'm very honest and I'm very transparent. Um, I am not a therapist, I'm a young black woman who has had a wealth of experience and I live my life and I'm very free and I do what the hell I like. And instead of liking my pictures on Instagram and watching me live my very best life, come into the workshop space, I'll give you the tools and techniques I've used and see if it works for you. If it doesn't, I apologize, but it costs you under 100 pounds. And if it does, I'll see you in first class. <laughs> Bars. Um, Marvin, talk to me about the black men that are in your group and your network. And since you've started your, it's a bit of a movement now, I would say, um, have you noticed a difference in their mindset in how they raise their kids, how they interact with their partners, how they just are as black men? Because it's now a space where they can talk about what it's like being a black dad and the difficulties and the great things about being a dad. Have you noticed a difference since the network has started? I mean, first and foremost, we'd we'll love to have you in there at some point. Um, <laughs> don't worry, I'm working on it behind the scenes. I'm, I'm setting updates. Um, so um, I think uh, when it comes to the uh, fathers in our group, what's really interesting, I'd never at length spent a significant amount of time with, with black men, in fact, any men. Um, and so this is the first time where I've heard men consistently, and that's been 12 months. And what's really interesting to me is um, having started doing my own internal work and being closer to my truth every single time, I can now spot, can I swear? I was say, I can, I can spot bullshit quicker. Um, and I can spot the ego from further away than ever before. And when we first started, it was a lot of posturing. It's like I'm a man and I'm in the space, but I have, you know, I'm earning and I'm doing a great job. And as time goes on and people start to insert truth into this space, you start to realize that they're, they're, the facades are peeled away and we get to the truth a lot faster. Um, we are seeing an, an, a halo effect of us all being in a space under the banner of dope black dads. It's, it's, it's a North Star. And our basic frameworks is you cannot bash women in that space. You can't talk about your, your mother of your child in some sort of negative way, we're not interested. You can't throw a naked picture of a woman and be like, oh, would ya? Can't do that either. <laughs> yeah, see, your groups, I know you. Um, <laughs> um, we don't allow, people that have been abusive to their children or their wife is, is definitely a non-dope space. Those are the key frameworks that we stick to. Everything else we accept and we bring in. And what's quite interesting, we was talking about um, Kwasi. Uh, is it, how do you say his real name? His name is Kwasi? It's like, it's Kwasi. Kwasi. Um, and we were talking about him, and, and my point to the group was, we cannot leave him outside the circle. He needs to be brought into the circle. I don't know he's actually full experience. It potentially sounds like he came from West Africa, arrived here, was very affluent, went straight up this path towards Etonian experience type living. And, and that's fine, but he's still a black man. He is still one of us. We are not a monolith. We do not live the exact same way. And I think by embracing him and connecting to him, we will start to challenge some of the ideas that he has, which has clearly been left unchallenged for way too long. In terms of the group, sorry, I'm fed up again. So in terms of the group, you'll never come back to me, so I'm not, I'm not stopping. Um, but in terms of the group, what, what's been really interesting is never having this much time with so many men, when we got to our truth, everybody's going through something. Everybody has challenges and we have been fluffing it. And I don't mean fluffing in terms of like getting it wrong, I mean we've just been blagging the whole thing. We've just been trying to figure out as we go along and using ego to power us through everything that's happened. And I think that's been sort of the biggest crime in terms of this idea of like toxic, toxic masculinity, which I don't even call that. My friend Darwood coined it as toxic bravado. And it's actually the bravado part is where we are stuck. The masculinity is beautiful. It's the complex part about our, our, our personality traits that make us men. That part is beautiful, but when we use it and fuel it only by ego, that's when it all falls down. And so quite very quickly, what we have is a committee. We have an executive group of 15 men. So every time someone comes with their ego, we collectively, we just paste the rules of the group back, in, back into the front of their conversation. We just keep doing it until they stop. So there's no room for posture. And then now we're saying that actually we feel comfortable around each other to say our truths. And the truths that are coming out are, are absolutely shocking. 
The experiences that we've lived as black men isn't this rose-tinted, amazing experience that potentially some of uh, the modern women has projected on black men. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that one. I'm, gonna, I'm going to stand there and say that. And what I want to incre improve the discourse that's going around in our community is this men versus women conversation. We will always support and provide space for women to understand and figure out who they are and come, out, and come into this world with their best foot forward. What I don't want that to be is at the expense of men in this understanding that men have had it right all along. I personally think women have had it right all along. I think they've had the right balance of humanity and professionalism, and we've gone off into this like, I must be a CEO. And then we've just run off into this dark space and then got it really wrong. And you can see that in people like Kanye West, and you can see it in people who become extremely toxic um, and get lost, the, the Quesses, the Quesses, I'm K. I'm sorry, I don't want to destroy his name. I have respect for him still. Um, so yeah, so my point is, is that this idea about uh, masculinity and how our group has been formed and what it's created is a safe space for you to discover who you are. Plus you have navigation from now a committee of 175 men from all over the world. We're now expanding into South Africa and the east of the US and those groups are also developing. And I think what's really important for us is to be kind to men slightly, <laughs> a little bit more than we have been because we're doing the work. We're not, we're, not, we're not blagging it anymore, we're doing the work and we're collecting men, hopefully you soon, um, to, 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 to improve our outcomes. And by improving our outcomes, it will improve your outcomes. My final filibuster, thank you. Um, thank you. Michelle, tell me about the obvious differences that you see from the black women you work with compared to the white women you work with in terms of their, their mentality and their attitude towards gaining success, if there is indeed a significant difference you see in trying to obtain professional success? Oh, interesting question. You didn't team me up for that. I, no, that, no problem. I think, you know, fundamentally there are going to be massive differences. I've just delivered a, a, a leadership seminar which was called More of You, and in the seminar I had a real eclectic group of women, um, Asian, black, brown, white women. Um, we were talking about issues to do with self-leadership. How do we fulfill our potential? So kind of coming back and looking at what it is that we can do to get the best out of ourselves, to be the best CEO, if you like, and defining success for our, ourselves. Um, not necessarily being the traditional CEO, but how do we navigate the spaces that we're in? And obviously, because I'm delivering it, it was about Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality, all the things that go with um, a black experience, if you like. And the difference between the white women and the black women in the, in the room was that the, the white women were stunned. They, they just couldn't understand the experiences that a lot of the black women were talking about in terms of the barriers that they experienced within their, their, their individual settings. Just being a black woman in the world, you know, the, the reality of confidence actually being a kind of revolutionary act, if you like. Um, and they were able to be confronted with their own privilege. And as a, as a black woman of mixed heritage, as a light-skinned black woman, I talked about my privilege and how I use that to my advantage and to others' advantage that look like me and to for black women in terms of opening up opportunities. They found that really, really uh, you know, surprising. Um, and their route, a lot of them, they were the youngest in the room and they were the managers already. Um, and so just by that mere fact alone, and they were having a really difficult time in managing their workforce. Um, and I talked about that whole kind of disruptive conversation when you're managing diverse teams actually it is more challenging and we have a whole workforce of managers who don't understand how to manage diversity and also don't understand what representation and diversity actually means within the workplace and so for them it was uh, a real uh, eye-opener and they learned loads um, in, in that kind of space and hearing the first-hand experiences of what discrimination does and, and how it it immobilizes us in lots of ways, but also how it can galvanize us and motivate us to, to come again and be to ultra creative and ultra innovative to find different ways to overcome the barriers. Um, I want to open up the floor to you guys now um, because I want to get some questions from, from the floor, the lady in the middle there. Hello, uh, my name's Joanne. Good evening, panel. 
Um, I've got two uh, brief questions. Well, the first one's a statement, and it's to the gentleman here. I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Um, it's Mar Marvin. Marvin, okay. Um, I think Nels, first of all, mentioned Kwasi Kwarteng, and you talked about him. Kwasi. Kwasi, sorry. Um, and you talked about you wanting him to come into your, your men's group because he was black. Okay, now, I, I'm just really curious as to whether you you feel that just because somebody has a black skin, um, you know, they have the same, we all have the same mindset. That's what you, you kind of, that's what I took from that because it's, it's, it's not the case. And I'm sure you're kind of aware of that. Just because we have a black skin, you know, we don't think, we don't all think alike. And I'm sure he's a really good example of somebody who would not fit your, um, sort of criteria of a man you'd want to belong, a father you'd want to belong to, to your group. Sorry, I just want a quick response to that. Um, I think, I think our, my point is, is that he could very much qualify as a dope black dad, even though his political views are different to mine. And I think that's the point, is that we are not a monolith. And so what I don't want is to create this space full of just people who think the same and do the same. He, within his own party, is still oppressed. He tried to run for the leadership. He got zero votes and voted out immediately. The establishment has spoken. He is not welcome. What his idea of and his approach in terms of trying to be who he is is incorrect. It will not work he for him. He doesn't see it that way, though. I'm sure not he yet. doesn't see it. The, the reality hit him already with his leadership, and he, he's now back in Boris, who's also particularly anti-black. But from my perspective is that if I'm presented with a man, we sat down with Sean Bailey, who's running for the mayor um, of London. He's a conservative candidate. And actually, we came up ready to, to get him. I'd be like, yeah, what do you stand for? And actually, he's just a human being that's had a very different experience to me. He has a clear perspective of his own identity. I just don't agree with it. But when, where we did meet, in terms of he is still proud to be black, his methods in delivering his blackness is just different. And we are interconnected regardless. If you speak to a black person on the phone, you kind of know they're black before. You're kind of, there's a frequency that connects us. And that's where we start to divide it. Because if you divide us by left and right wing, and then you divide us by religion, and then you divide us by light skin and dark skin, there's nothing left. There's no one here. What are we fighting for? That's, that's how they've already broken us down already. And, I, and I'm trying to stop that, that dialogue from continuing. Okay, okay, thank you. Do you have another quick question? Quickly, please. Sorry, to, to this lady here from Haringey, from Mind. Um, m my question uh, to you is, I, I wanted to, to get a bit more clarity on exactly what it is you're providing uh, to black people or people of African descent who are experiencing, um, you know, mental health crises. Because uh, I don't know what it's like in Haringey, but in Lambeth, I was born and brought up in Brixton, and in Lambeth, the situation is just um, dire. And I've been into mental health uh, institutions and mental, mental health hospitals, and the black people in there seem to be, you do get, um, obviously you get psychiatrists, you get psychotherapists, and you get doctors. But in the main, they seem to be colluding with the people who are just medicating them. And I'm just really interested in what you think um, black people should be doing in, 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 in these institutions and in this sector? Sorry, it's a good question. Just to kind of explain, MIND is a voluntary and community organisation. So what we're not part of are statutory mental health services that are overrepresented with black people in locked wards, being sectioned, etc. We are the other side when they come out of that treatment. We support them with their psychosis, with the things that they need, housing, etc. So we're the total opposite of, of that system that you talk about. I can't speak for the whole mental health system. I got into mental health because way too many black people were dying in some of those institutes. I can only speak for myself. If there are people in that system, I'm sure, and they're black, I'm sure their intent is to help but the system is huge, and I don't think that medical model of giving people drugs and locking them up when you think they're risky is going to change. It won't change because some of our community actually agrees with some of that. When, when they're in crisis, rather than deal with it before it gets to that, they wait until they need to go to that system to get that help. Yeah, What we all need to do is help each other long before any of us 
need that part of the system and that kind of help. So I can only speak from my mind. We actually pick up the pieces of the mental health system that is pretty much not fit for purpose when it comes to black African, black British, etc. Okay, we've got three at the back. Can we keep them really brief? Because we've got to wrap up and I would like you guys to um, possibly network afterwards. Three quick questions, please. Keep it brief, please. Um, a white man I know professionally, but not personally, said to me um, not recently that um, he assumed that I didn't have a dad. He said, oh, well, I assume there's no black dad in your house, so there's a lot of man-hating going around. And I was quite offended by that because I thought, why do you assume I don't have a dad? I haven't mentioned him, but why do you assume there's not one there? So, Marvin, is that sort of the reason you created Dope Black Dads show? There are decent black men around who father their children and are good role models. Yeah. Can you answer that in 30 seconds as well? Sorry, I know. <laughs> I saw you, I saw you adjusting. Yeah. Um, so, we, we started it um, to clear up that narrative, but actually what it became is about um, um, black men. And this generation of black men are doing that work already. We're trying to be active. But what we don't, don't have is necessarily all the tools. So, I wouldn't be concerned about the, the particular white person who says those things on you. Don't internalize it. There are many, many ignorant people out there and there's no point trying to answer them all or trying to internalize every single thing that happens to you. As long as you know that our, your community, which we are, doing that work, that's what should uh, give you best pride. We could have one more question and please, super brief, because we've got to get out of here and like now. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try my best. My, my question is really is, was, was actually spurred on from um, Marvin's um, discussion about um, cr crazy. I'm not sure if I said it right. But um, uh, I, I, one of the things that I've, I've thought of is that I'm not sure if black people are as safe as they think they are institutionally in left, left, more left-leaning politics. And I say that because, admittedly, I'm, I'm a Tory. And I stood at local council elections last year, um, member of Young Conservatives. I'm voting on whether I want Steve, Stephen, uh, uh, Boris Johnson or the other one to be leader in a few weeks. And um, I'll tell you this really quick story. So on one occasion, essentially, I was with my friend and we we're talking in a kebab shop and this, this, this Labour councillor overheard me talking about why I'm a conservative. And to wrap it up, he essentially said to me, how can you be a conservative? What would your ancestors think? And I got so, I was disgusted. I said to him, you, you're right, man. You had my ancestors in chains. They will be telling me, why are you letting another right man tell you what to think? And he eventually walked off. And as I was, before he came up to me, I was saying to my friend, the reason why I'm not in the Labour Party is because they're still racist, but they will be racist to you by being kind to you, kinder to you than anybody else. Because, and they assume that they've got your vote, they've, they've got your mind, they, they've, they've, they've purchased your mind somehow. And this guy came up to me and proved, and what I thought proved my point was just like that. So my question really is, do, is like, do, do you feel that, um, that perhaps that black people may need to review like where they stand politically if they're like as safe as where they are. Do Aziza or Michelle want to? Yes. Do you have an answer there? I agree with Marvin. Mm -hmm. Aziza? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'll pass. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Lynette, do you have an answer to that question? Yeah, probably we do need to represent ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know about the politics of Labour and Conservative. But I would say both of those. You need to find your own uh, answer to what's going on in this country. A quick plug: We did actually a show on this season around being black and conservative. So if you haven't seen that show, check it out. Um, can we get a round of applause, please, for our panel before we wrap up? Thank you very much. <laughs>